So, Rick's making us do a video. <laughs> nah, we really enjoy it, really. Basically, we've got me, Matt, doesn't need an introduction, the Viking, Josh. He basically, we, um, we come together because we all have different training styles. We're gonna just talk you through it. Like, I guess, little tips and tricks that we can hopefully help people with, or I know Josh is desperate to show people kind of what his version of overload is and, and how he does it, because he uses a logbook, he's religious with the logbook, which is cool. I'm kind of like, I log big lifts and that's it. Matt doesn't, Matt hates it, wants to burn them. We're all friends though, and, her, and we'll kind of figure it out that way. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to do a seated row, I'm going to take Matt through basically how I get ready. So my style of training, progressive overload, on 99% of the movements is going to be a top set and a back off set. So the most important thing about those sets is they're both taken to failure in slightly different rep ranges. So the top set will be generally a lower rep range, somewhere between the 6 to 10, and the back off set will be somewhere between a 10 to 15. But the most important thing for me is how you get to that point. So obviously a top set's gonna be pretty heavy for an individual. So to go there off the bat would be retarded and you're gonna kind of injure yourself. You're not gonna get the most out of it. So I wanna take Matt through the process of getting to that top set, being able to neurally switch on, being able to feel the muscle, being able to warm up, but also most importantly, not being able to take away from that top set by fatiguing. So some people will lead in with way too high a volume so when they get to that top set, they'll be compromised from a strength point of view. So this is what we're going to do. And I'm going to get Matt on the machine now. So the first the like lead-in set, warm-up set, priming set, I call them lead-in sets. Um, I'm going to take Matt through a slightly higher rep. So this is going to be an eight to 10. So the weight is light. It's not really going to take much away from him, but it's going to get some blood through the muscles. It's going to get Grease the groove of the movement, um, and it's going to be like a higher volume set. So, like I said, just kind of get some blood in the in the muscle before we then take the weight up and the reps down before we hit that top set. Question: How much difference is there in weight between that first lead-in set and the working? Typically, quite a, quite a bit. Like generally, let's say. You know, the, the first lead-in set wants to be a, a very, very kind of manageable weight. Uh, especially if this was the first exercise, you know, that your body's not used to training yet, you're still warming up. So the weight will be quite low. How you then stagger that is going to be dependent on the movement, depending on where you are in the session. The further on in the session you are, the more warmed up you're already going to be. So the less lead-in sets you're going to need. The point of lead-in sets at that point is more so just to kind of get used to a movement again so it might only be one leading set before you can do your top set whereas if this is the first movement we're probably going to do three leading sets so on this next one Matt's going to do four to six reps again I say four to six because if he feels he just needs a couple more to kind of feel that movement and get locked in he'll do it if he feels pretty happy with that he can stop at four but ultimately it's never going to kind of take anything away these are still very easy kind of sets and manageable sets really so if you're ready buddy Off the start, just talking to Matt, we sort of guesstimated that he'd be working around the 110 for his working set. So this final lead-in set was taken to 103, so just shy of that top set. Um, and he's only gonna do kind of two or three reps. Again, this now is more from a neural point of view, so that he can get used to the weight. It's not when he touches that top set, it's not gonna be a surprise. He's not gonna spend the first two reps thinking, fuck me, this is heavy. He's gonna know what he's on about and he can get straight into it and then work from there. Everything stay nice and tight. His execution will stay kind of immaculate throughout. The last couple of reps of the top set, I'd expect to see a little bit of sort of body motion, a little bit of cheating, but the majority of the reps will be very clean and will be kind of really on the money. You're basically figuring out what weight is going to be required while being warm and mobile. I guess you wouldn't figure out, would you? Because you would, yeah, already, I, I know, it, yeah. you would have it in a book. Yeah. So you sort of just stagger down. Yeah. That's Where what this is. is, it's all about getting primed and ready for that one so big set. Matt, yeah. Matt can work, you know, you're not tired, 
but you feel like, you know what the movement feels like, you're warmed up enough so that we've not got any injury risk and uh, yeah, it's like an all out failure set. So although the, the target might be like an 8 to 10, if you get to 10 and there's more there, we'll kind of keep pushing. Uh, I think that's sometimes where people get confused, they might see a rep range and they'll be like, oh I've got 8 to 10, I'll stop. It's basically two failure sets aiming for a certain rep range, but if you don't, you know, if, if, you, if you're doing it for the first time and you mis, misjudge, then it doesn't matter, just go to failure. So the back off set, that's a question probably a lot of people want to know. The back off set sounds like it's going to be an easy set. Is that the case? Not really, no. Like, it depends what, like it's a failure set in a higher rep range, so. Yeah. Would you ever go reverse? Would you ever do your higher rep set first? I don't intend to, but if like something's particularly niggly maybe, then I might do a higher rep set like to failure first, because then obviously the load's gonna be lower, so the danger factor, and then when you hit that top set, after the back off set, you're not gonna be able to lift as much, but the, the rep range will be, again, kind of wherever that target is. So you can see there, obviously we took that set to mechanical failure. Matt raised a really good point before he asked me, you know, are we gonna kind of force any reps? Obviously on a, on a row, it's hard to really force anything without cheating it. My answer to him was like, if there's one there where you could kind of, like it was a sort of partial rep to finish. Now the reason I say that is because obviously I log everything. And if you start doing multiple partials, it gets a bit blurry. So my rule of thumb is, push the failure. If there's a, a half rep or a partial rep, work that. I made Matt hold that in that partial range for a split second. And then I can log that. So I can log, I, I can't remember how many he did, but I think it was like 10 or 11. And then I put a plus one to indicate that I went for that final rep, but I didn't quite get it. So again, from an accountability point of view and something I can track moving forwards, it's clear cut for me um, and, and easy to identify kind of where I'm at. And, you know, it's very easy to be arrogant and say, oh, well, my method works, etc. But I'm, I'm interested in... Well, that's the thing, like, every method works. Like, on the way down here, I say it in, in the car to myself, to Instagram. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no one was there. But, like, there's many ways to skin a cat. That's the joys of bodybuilding. Like, you do what fires you up and what gets you going and like, what you enjoy. For me, like, I fucking love the idea of I have kind of a, a finite number of opportunities per session to really take it there, whereas other people like might like just fucking working really damn hard without maybe as much structure. That's cool, like if you can prove to work. So yeah, I think that's a nice thing about what we've kind of all got to bring is. We said, we said a similar thing when we were on the adult, we said a similar thing. It's like, anyone who tells you that this is the way, they're wrong, like immediately it's, it's learning about trying all the different methods and giving them time as well. Like people try, log booking six months and they go oh it's shit and then they try just winging it and then, oh it's shit you know you need to give things a lot of time what it was all time i think as well like i chose this like matt mentioned doing a, maybe a bicep movement and i said actually i'd rather do a, a row because ironically although i am very back top and back offset orientated i appreciate certain muscle groups it, it's not necessarily the best way so like arm training i don't think that having that in a single joint move movement and if it's such a small muscle is as effective as maybe putting a bit more volume in there still bring the same intensity but you know same with sort of shoulders like my lateral raises some of them won't be top and back offsets so they'll be higher volume sets with maybe a rest pause and a drop set etc uh, but i suppose the the bulk of the compound movements will always be in that format that's where i find like the most benefit from progressive overload like you talk about biceps, you said you may do higher volume in terms of maybe not a top set and a back up set, but do you always build to your work sets in the same fashion that we have then? Yes, yeah, so that's probably where it, where it differs. I actually like on 
delts, so for lateral raises and for maybe pet decks, so those sort of movements and biceps extensions, bicep curls, I'll do slightly higher volume progressive sets. So maybe like a 20, a 15 and a 10, and then take whatever style of set I might be doing on that. So yeah, again, like it's having that, I suppose I've got my, 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 my overall ethos, but I'm not arrogant enough or naive enough to think that that is necessarily going to apply to everything. We go through our sessions, we go through our careers and we feel out kind of what we like and what feels good. I think that's really important and it, you know, it's a useful feedback tool. If you're just drilling yourself into something that really doesn't feel great, don't do it, pretty much. Okay. Solid advice. I think we all agree on that 100%. <laughs> We're all experienced bodybuilders, but we all train in gyms where we see lots of the newer generation having seen something on Instagram. Like they'll, they'll see the way Josh trains on Instagram local and they'll have an idea of it, but they'll be doing it so terribly wrong that it's actually counterproductive to their progress. Whereas, again, probably why we're making this video and actually demonstrating how it's carried out because then people can actually go, actually, Although I use a logbook and I believe the logbook is the way to progress, I'm actually using it incorrectly. And probably everything I'm doing isn't conducive to me progressing as a bodybuilder. I'm either going to injure myself. Like I say, it's no see, I, I grew up on the logbook and then in recent years I've changed sort of my philosophies and the way that I train. But I still have a load of lessons from it and there's still a, the people that use it and use it correctly, like you can't say Josh hasn't made progress as a bodybuilder. <laughs> Like, we can't turn around and say, that doesn't work, because there he is. And also, there's a lot of other top bodybuilders that use this, but unfortunately, because of the world of Instagram and shit just rolls downhill, people pick and choose the bits that they think are correct, and everyone wants to say, oh, I'm this strong, I'm this strong, I'm this strong. They get so caught up in strength that they actually lose the lessons that the logbook teaches them, and then they don't get the progress. Right? Josh said, said earlier, before we started filming, like, He's progressive overload and like so am I and he's log book, log book, log book, but he considers himself weak. <laughs> like, but well, that's not because he's weak, that's because he does it correctly. And people start doing stuff that they're moving weight so they've got no business even touching. And that's not going to equal progress. Whereas when you do it correctly, like, proof's in the pudding. My warm-ups or lead sets, warm -up sets, whatever you want to call them, slightly different to Josh. In fact, it's probably the polar opposite. I don't do the lowering of reps as we get close to the work set. Um, generally, we're going to treat this like it's the first exercise in the gym. Tyler's going to do bike and press. So initially, generally for the first exercise, I'll do, I'll do something like 15 to 20 reps. Very, very low weight. Really, really concentrating on just feeling the muscle and just getting that contraction down the line it will help so I just want Tyler to do 20 reps and just really really just nice knees whatever just think and think and think and just concentrate on feeling your shoulders work and then we build the weight up through the work sets and generally like we said obviously up on the row we had to work out what I was going to do but Josh would always know what he was going to do because he had it written down in the log book. I'm very much every, everything on that day in the gym is like it's the first time you've ever really been in a gym. So you have good days, bad days, strong days, weak days. As you get through those sets, just feel. If we say that for this, we're gonna say the first work set wants to be around Tyler's 15 rep max. So we wanna hit 15 reps and that's your failure point. So as we warm up, everything's gonna be, we're gonna do 10 reps on everything after that 20 rep set. He's just gonna add weight and just feel and then when he gets to 10 reps, I think, right, the next set will probably have to hit 15 at failure. So it's just feeling your way there. Like, bodybuilders talk about training with feel, and a lot of people misinterpret that as, oh, they just go in the gym and do what the fuck they want, and there's no plan or structure. When I say train with feel, it's almost feeling your way towards a work set, as opposed to, I'm just tossing it off and doing what I want. So, right, so we'll go 20 reps, mate, and just... So basically, I don't know if it's worth mentioning, but I'm, I'm pumped now, to be fair-ish. So, even in the first warm-up, blood's in there, man. That, that first movement is just literally about 
I know the whole fucking mind muscle connection, people with bollocks, like, but it's just about just putting some blood in that muscle and just feeling it and knowing how the movement feels and just getting used to it. Because as you work, that's the feeling you're looking for every set. It's not a case of, right, now we're just going to throw weight and bang reps out. It is always about making sure the target muscle is doing the work. Uh, and then once we, once we build up to the work set, again, where Josh does a top set, which is sort of a heavier weight, and then he backs off, I try and keep the same weight for all the work sets. Sometimes if volume gets higher across a session, you may have to reduce, because I don't like going below six reps. So the idea is maybe for the first set, if we aim for that 15 rep max, and then just naturally, because we're at failure, the reps will drop every set. So if we do three, three sets, you might hit 15 to fail, and then in that next set, you might get 12, 13, just naturally, because you're not gonna be as strong in that next set because you've just gone all the way to failure. And then in that third set, again, you might drop down to nine or eight reps. If you added a fourth set, you keep, but I wouldn't like to go below six reps. You go in with a plan, like, so you don't just like, you don't just on training shoulders and then turn up and do what you want. So generally like, everyday structure, so shoulder day, arm day, blah, blah, blah. And then within that, I will have, say on shoulder, I will say like, right, I've got two, two side raises, a press, uh, and then how many work sets in the rep range. I won't have the exercises nailed down. Um, before I start the session, it's secure, but literally I have like a basic structure all the way down until what the actual exercises are. So I'll have like a, so if it's say, ch say chest press, it's like, right, first exercise is a press, the second one's a fly, the next two are chest presses, and then I'll slot in and then every day that can change. Like two, three, four weeks in a row, I might do the same exercises, but the order of every exercise may change. So again, why personally for me, a logbook doesn't work because if I if I put like chest fly first and then logged it, if I then did it at the end, it wouldn't, you're not gonna get the same. So it, to, for me, it's structure. And that just comes down to experience, doesn't it? The yeah. fact that you've done. I still think you have to have a plan. Like, you can't wake up on Monday and go, what shall I train today? And you can't go in the gym, like, right, it's chest day. All oh, right, that's free. I'm gonna bang some of them out. Oh, I'll do five, six sets, like, it happens. And then, at the minute with my training, across the week, I add an additional set in. So the volume sort of climbs week on, week on, to a point where then it comes back down again. Again, progressive overload, like, like it's just in, in, a, in a more intuitive manner, isn't it? Like, yeah, like, like, to me, progressive overload, just facilitates and underpins everything. Whereas I believe that the progressions just occur naturally. But like I always just say train hard, train on the limits. For me, like when you first go in the gym, like this, because I, I work in sort of rep maxes a lot of the time. So say it's a 15 rep max. If you went on the gym on day one and did your 15 rep max, but then just kept that weight for 15 reps forever, nothing's gonna happen. But if you say every day is your 15 rep max, Three, four weeks later, that 15 rep max, oh, I've added two or three kilos. But that just comes from training hard, as opposed to I have, a, I have reps to hit. So I think naturally, as long as you're on the limits all the time, you get better and better and better. And all you're doing in a session is, as your ability increases, training hard just keeps up with, it's almost like you're just playing catch up with, as you improve, high effort means that everything in the gym improves as opposed to sometimes I think the logbook is trying to overreach and go in front of improving and then I'll catch that up. So it's just sort of, I, I personally think sometimes it's the dog or the cat or the tail wagging, put that shit out. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes think it's the tail wagging the dog as opposed to the other way around. So I, but it, like I say, it's just what we all like. If, if someone was a beginner, would you recommend they take a more like structured approach or is this something that someone could do from day one? Yeah, I, I believe this is structured, like, as long as they know what a rep max is. But again, I was saying to Tyler earlier, like, right now, I'm not a big logbook user. In the beginning, the one lesson I learned from logbooking was how to train hard. Sometimes form might have been a bit shit. You might have sacrificed certain things to hit numbers, but the one thing you developed was a mindset. When you're chasing numbers and you'll do anything to get there, you do develop a mindset which says, right, in the gym, we leave nothing in a machine. And then 
it's sort of maybe about harnessing that and then taking that with control and, and that's sort of where you get better so as a beginner a lot, as long as they're doing it similar I think a log book can teach you lessons but I think the thing that we'll all agree on is that it's effort intensity and no matter your methods without effort and intensity you're not going to go anywhere but at the end of the day all muscle building is it's a, it's a response to stress if the stress isn't there the response isn't there we have to put the body under stress it's not about oh, did, like I've given clients like right this is your rep range I've done it with log books I've done it with this and like Josh said people go oh there's my rep range and fuck off and it's like no you've still got to use a weight to fail in that rep range you've just gone oh that's 10 I'm off own but you haven't done anything to even elicit a response from that training and then they wonder why nothing changes oh well, I'm doing everything I'm ticking the boxes yeah you might be in the rep range but you're not failing in that rep range I, I do believe that like you have to get you don't have to go all the way to failure like reps and reserves bollocks in my opinion like if, you, if you're in the gym and you're going to train hard just do the extras like you're there unless you're recovering but if, if people aren't doing anything you don't have to go all the way to failure like there's certain studies and shit like or bollocks or whatever science that says that a training response may begin to creep in around sort of five reps from failure and then every rep closer to failure you're gonna go so I built my training sort of on that philosophy that you have to get somewhere close to failure it doesn't always have to be there like so as we'll see like we're only gonna do one work set with Tyler like say I would normally do three so the first work set I, I would say take it to your last good rep when you know right then if I attempt another rep I'm gonna fail stop short of that one and then the final work set I always try like we did on the row with Josh, I'll always say I have a one force. If you've got a training partner, force that rep out or pull or push or put effort into it. Don't all these shitty partials that don't do anything. I think it's the effort of actually trying to contract the muscle and keep pushing into it, almost like an ISO partial where you're trying, and that's what calls on those like. Um, gonna have to cut this bit out or we can leave the really really awkward part to be fair mate, we can leave the old, we can leave the awkward pause I think Matt's on a four minute <laughs> solid philosophy well, of training rant and has. to be fair to him you've done a fucking good job without motor units stopping motor, motor units the high threshold motor units <laughs> thanks for that cut him out <laughs> he's not there really <laughs> um, the high threshold motor units that we need to call upon at the end like so I see people when they they're almost getting to that point and then they just start going crazy like, we can do that. I think we have to do something the body can't do and actually send the signals. That's all muscle building is, just a signal and response. So in that final set, I would say to Tyler, right, when, even though you know you can't get another rep, attempt it, and maybe you'll just spend two or three seconds just pushing and trying, and then that's it. So. You're cold now. Oh, you I want me, no, I'm warm, I'm warm. For the sake of the camera, I'm warm, I'm not swimming, man. Matt's tempo. tempo is a lot slower than mine and that's a good thing in a, in a sense, it's nice to try some How much faster are you? We'll see you in 20 minutes. Yeah. I know Matt, me and Matt have spoke about this before, uh, you like to keep muscles essentially moving don't you? Throughout the whole range usually. Anyway. <laughs> spoke about when I'm locking out, oh, yeah. like, you like to keep a flow don't you? When, when we're trying to warm up and just get blood in there, like that. I think in the warm up we, we create habits. So the last thing we want to do when it gets hard, because that's the first thing I see people do, when shit gets hard, they'll take breaks. Like whether it's a leg press or a hack squat, oh, I'm just going to sit in the lockout. So if in your warm up set, I think we're creating habits. If you keep that continuous motion going, plus blood can't leave the muscle when it's like, muscle gets a little rest and then blood can leave and we might lose out on a little bit of a fight again. This is again. I took into into my training. You, Matt told me this about a year ago, that's why I mentioned it, because I did a set of hacks and he said, I stop a lot at the top, because I sometimes get stuck in a bit of a mindset of being a power builder type of thing, and, and he said, just keep the, keep the constant tension, and, and, I, and I enjoy that, I found value in it, so it's good to think about. And at the end, I don't think you get any greater, necessarily, I mean, a bit of blood vault, but let's split in here, but the way I do things, uh, and the way Josh does it, at the end of it, I think the potential to build muscle is the same. But let's say on here, 
we warmed Tyler up with the same method that I did, his work set, the weight he used for that work set, would be far greater than how, obviously, we're talking in between, but he'd be moving a little bit faster, so that that's that working set, there's a difference in weight, but the end outcome would still be the same, the intensity would still be the same, but in my opinion, it's safer. So, it brings about maybe a longevity. If you're putting less stress through connective tissues and things like that, it, in my opinion, it's a little bit more efficient and safer way of building muscle as opposed to using heavier weights for a top set and a back off set. Um, and the reason I started training like this, because I used to train like that, and I was bollocks. Like my body was beat up the foot. I had triple ply knee sleeves on, and every every time I went down at a warm up for hacks, I was like, please don't fucking break. And I don't think that's... People say, oh, you should be scared of your training. And I think, yeah, like you should know that this is going to be hard, but you should be terrified of breaking. And when you're at a point where, oh, fucking hell, like this hurts, like when warm-up hurts and you feel old, but I thought, I'm going to have to stop bodybuilding. And I changed my way of training and touch wood, like everything's fresh. I don't wear sleeves, wraps, anything like that. Everything feels like it's on the muscle and, and I just feel healthier and and better within and it feels like muscles hurt when you finish training but I'm not covered in Quan Loom oil and fucking deep heat and like wrapped up to fuck like you see people um but yeah we just get these fucking monies without me <laughs> this is that pre-workout I should not have had it <laughs> I think it literally you could probably tell on video when it kicked like yeah. Matt started talking about yeah, it. He was like, oh, okay, just so went, you were going to do a shoulder press. And the thing is, this is what And then that was it, man. <laughs> but he's asking for how oh, fucking magic question. I lost that one question between the sets, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we've got a few more weights to put some What did you just say? I can do more weight, so it doesn't matter. I got nine. Oh, I thought you said, because I'm natty. And I was like, oh, I'm not natty. So we're going to treat this as that first work set. Like I said, we're aiming for a 15 rep max. Tyler might be happy to crop it, put it. I think with max tempo, I, I, this will be hard. So, so yeah, so we're going to take it to failure, which, as I said, when you know the next rep you won't get, stop. Yeah, so literally take to the, the last rep you can complete in a good form. Some might call it mechanical fail, I don't know. The cool words, the cool words. words. Words, yeah. Right? yeah, I don't know what they are. You don't know the words for anything. How I describe it is, if you were squatting, if you're not going to come back up and you're going to crush yourself, don't attempt that rep. set with the same weight all of a sudden it's like that's loads better i think as you build like this if you did another set now 
like you know, although you're not going to get as many reps, I actually think the set itself will feel better because and then even the third set again may feel even because you know the weight, your body's whereas sometimes I think sw switching weights between it's almost like oh my body just sort of learned like that like everything got and then oh, I've changed the weight again and now it's new again. Whereas I think that was Tyler's shoulder pads <laughs> falling out. <laughs> my rotation. Like, oh, yeah, I think for me, immediately with max tempo, it must be a little, it's sort of slower than mine. Immediately, like even just making a change like that yourself, it, it's dramatic. Like I, my strength curve, I have in my head because we're so experienced. And then but I think Josh would get the same effect. Like yeah. when I asked him the question about would he ever go lighter first, I think you would hate putting more weight on the foot. The foot. Whereas when you drop off, it's almost like, well, my body's just handled this weight. So dropping down, it just, oh, that feels real fucking good. Well, that's why for me, like that last leading set yeah. needs to be very close to the top working set yeah. so that like there isn't that shock factor. Yeah. So even if it's a one or a two repper, yeah. you know what you're dealing with when you go into that. So, yeah. I, think, I think that's, again, like you, you see people using a log book and they go, oh, but they almost want to, they almost want to lift more in the top set. So they think, oh, well, I'll just go a little bit lighter here. So I might get an extra, oh, because I see people say, oh, right, I did X weight for this rep, I'm going to do less warm-up sets next week, so I'll do more. I'm like, well, surely that's, you're just doing less to do more. That's fucking bollocks. Like, <laughs> I always stick by the same. I don't log my leading sets because I've, I've done this long enough now, but like, they will be the same. Right? And at the same time, if anything, potentially one week they might be higher volume if I do come in and feel shit and I need that extra bit of time just to get into a movement and get warm. But the way I structure my sessions, I'll probably cover this later, the kind of programming of the exercises means that the heavier compounds are a bit later in the session, so I'm never going to feel shit or like crunchy or kind of creaky when I get to them. Um, but yeah, that's no, it's cool. That's it, I think you, when you come in and you do, you do your stuff, as you get into the middle, like, we don't, we're warm, like everything's sort of starting to feel good anyway, um, and it's, again, if you gave it to a client, would you put like percentages on anything or are you not that? No, I'm not, and I'll tell you why, because people don't know what 100% is. So there's no point in me telling them what 80%, you know, because I want people to go to failure. And that's why I don't do the reps in reserve, because a lot of people... Do it anyway. They, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they'll, they'll push up an eight, work, eight, an eight rep failure set and that'll be like two reps in reserve. You know, if I was there shouting at them or if someone had a gun to the head, that old analogy, they would get more. So you have to be very experienced to benefit from any sort of reps in reserve. Chin, weight selection, I think we agree is one of the art. We were talking about it yesterday. One of the hardest things about the whole, the whole fitness thing in general, like knowing what weight is effective and what weight isn't on all different exercises is just a massive of experience. And I think coming into bodybuilding, muscle building, whatever, as a, as a beginner, it's really difficult to understand where you even lie in half the exercises. So you can understand how people get really confused with log booking, they get confused with just doing it because they just, they don't know what a good set is until you train with Dave down the road who just blows you away on, on back squats. Or then you go, well, okay, now I've set a new standard, but there's people out there training for three, four years, logging everything that have never seen 80%. So I don't know, you know. So I always say like, everyone trains hard until they learn how to train hard. Because if you, I've never said something, do you train hard? And they go, no. Because like, they, they think they do. And you go, but you don't, because I've watched you. And like, this is hard. And I, it's the same, like, I used to think I train hard. Then I went on a session about fails. And I thought, I don't train hard. But then I guess like, as it's probably one of the things that we, we sort of neglect when we have these types of discussions. We sort of think, actually, when we look at beginners, all the shit we're talking about, they don't actually know what it is. Yeah, like, yeah. how, how do we translate that to like because we can say well, well what's failure oh well failure is when you can't do any more so they're like fucking I'm like yeah but it's no mechanical failure when you can't do the full rep and they're like what the fuck are you talking about we may I don't know do we need an idiot's guide to the gym <laughs> I think that would be a good place to start I mean that's the, I think that's the problem with the gym we, we try and put it on paper we're all coaches we try and put it on paper and in those first two years, it's very difficult to even understand. Even if you can understand it literally, like you can read it, knowing what it applies to in the gym is very, it's very difficult. And even if I put my training style on paper, you could come in the gym and go, yeah, exactly. well, you're not doing it. Because we all, we all adapt, like, like one of the reasons why I don't love it, because 
within sets, I might slow something down or speed something up. That would fuck my logbook. But I'm like, oh, I've just taken a, that set took, that rep took one second longer than that. Like, I don't want to think, oh God, this isn't standardized. But if, if something's feeling really good, I'm a stick in there. But someone could go in and go, hey, on your training plan, you told me I couldn't do that. Like, you're a liar. And it's like, well, no, actually, we're just experienced to be able to almost adapt within a session to how something feels. But, I've read Max before. I've done like Ronnie Coleman workouts at like 20 years old, walked out and went, ah, oh, piece of piss, you know what I mean? Because I'm doing it rep for rep. And then you're like, it's like Phil Heath, you go, oh, I'll do the Philly Farm workout. You walk out, you're like, ah, oh, Philly's, Philly's a Muppet. But truth is, you don't, it's just words. They mean nothing. It's all application. And I think that is the true, the true skill and the true message here, isn't it really? That it's application above, above whatever can be written. So Tyler, yes. what are you talking about? So basically I've been given the, uh, the shittest job going after two El Gigantes. And they've both pretty much said everything that can possibly be said. So I've got to kind of come up with something cool to say. Um, so in relation to training, how I train, it's, it's not a hybrid because I'd say it leans more towards Matt, but I also have a lot of logging tendencies like Josh and, and how Josh trains, I, I really respect it because I think the whole issue we have with the log, I don't have an issue with the logbook, but the issue with the logbook that we all agree on is that it's just not standardized. Like if you standardize it, it's a fantastic tool. So beyond that, like if your form is perfect, it's great. What I decided with the logbook though was, I love tracking my big compound lifts. It made me thick, it made me dense. So it, it, it worked for me. Um, but I just didn't really like, and this is a personal preference, and I didn't enjoy logging everything. So, you know, I'd do a big compound lift and then I'd move deeper into the session and I'd be logging things like side laterals and I'd be logging rear delts and I'd be just like, this doesn't make sense to me. I rotate my exercises too much. I didn't like it. So how I train is kind of like, it undulates, it kind of goes opposite. So I'll start with the big heavy compounds. I never go below eight reps, but I rotate all my reps weekly, eight, 12, 15, 20, so each week's different. Once I've hit that and I take as much rest as I can on those, I try and obviously get as much weight up as I can with perfect form. And then after that, it kind of goes in a sense of rest gets shorter, exercises become more free. So it kind of goes opposites. And then I finish doing crazy shit like metabolite where just leathering myself to bits. So that's kind of how it goes. Heavy, less important, but still light, not tracked. Lighter, lighter, less rest, less rest. It gets more intense to go on and less heavy. So what we're doing today is we're gonna do a side lateral with the guys because we've done two exercises and all we're basically gonna show them is, but they already know, but is if they're beginners. <laughs> we agree that the side lateral is the most butchered exercise ever. And it's partly due to something that we all call efficiency. So we look at crossfitters and everyone laughs at the way they do chin-ups. Actually, they're doing exactly what they're meant to do. They're being really efficient. They're using as little muscle as possible. That's exactly what they're meant to do. So if you want to build muscle, do the exact opposite, okay? You want to be as inefficient as possible. You want to be making an exercise as difficult as it can be. Every time you move your toe, every time you wiggle your body, every time you do a little jellyfish movement, you're limiting the effect you can have on your muscle tissue. What's a jellyfish movement? I can show you. want to show it, Matt? I don't know what a jellyfish movement This, this one on the side of that rock. I don't know what a jellyfish movement This one. <laughs> is that a jellyfish? <laughs> Big, but I see it all the time though. I'm like, wow, my shoulder's getting bigger because you're not using them. Okay, you're not using the muscle. You kind of got to do that if you want to build them. So yeah, things like that. Every time you do these jellyfish movements, so you're tapping your toe or you're wiggling or you're straining or you're getting into a bench and setting yourself up, you're losing the ability to connect. So what we're going to do is a side lateral. I'll probably do it in, in, in a, I'll probably add a drop set or something because no one's in there. It's going to look cool. I'll make it look like I'm a really good trainer. People, sure. people think I look five foot five, and then as I'm, you know who did that to me, Matt? Was it you, Matt? I thought Matt. Be, no, who was it? Sass as well. I see Matt and Sass, and I thought Sass is gonna be really short, and like as he come closer, it was like this, and I was like, what the? Because he was so, he was wide. Do you know what I mean? It's so strange. Obviously, Josh's side raises were fantastic, so I didn't really have anything to say. Still, still yeah. Generally, like because I've got like, although it was a decade ago, I've got a swimming background. My capacity for oh, like higher volume work is, is, is like better than some. That's interesting then. Yeah, I've always noticed that. I know when I've trained with people, like the, the higher end sets. You kind of deal with that very well. Of, I like could deal with that better than some, yeah. That's interesting because so. I'm background based. I, I'm, I'm high intensity. I can, I'm good for sprinting, that's it. Long yeah. distance, even in school when I was 10 stone, I couldn't do 1500 meters. And now I do the opposite of what I'm probably built for. Yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting that yeah, maybe so that might be something in that, man, yeah. yeah. Out the window, and that proves, and you probably wouldn't even look too far bad. 
and that proves the point on the that's, and the reason this is a good exercise for it how, how efficient or how inefficient can you make it like yeah like i'm making that not out of because you're telling me to it's just kind of how anyone who's trained hard do it, does yeah, yeah. making it hard because i'm getting more out of it and then also from like an injury you know risk point of view the better and harder you do a movement the lower the load the less risk of injury so, Using more weight for no reason subjects you to ridiculous injury risk for nothing. It doesn't build you any more muscle, it wears your joints faster. It doesn't really do anything apart from maybe add an ego element. You look cool on Instagram. That, genuinely, that's it. I genuinely, there's people out there going 10, 20% too heavy, restricting their muscle growth potential, risking themselves of injury or possibly being injured just to look good on Instagram. And you know what? They don't even look good because anyone who knows, knows. Here we go. Oh! Yeah, we're doing a triple drop set guys, but the thing is, even though Josh might want to at some stage, because even though our strongest, he will want to start moving, he's going to resist it, and that's the point. Doesn't matter what we get, it's all feel. See, he looked quite calm. He could have, I know he could have done 50 on the last exercise because they're not even that heavy, but he's just making his muscle do the work. Internally, there's chaos. Externally, chaos. yeah, externally, he looks quite chill. Like just the, yeah, that hurts. Got you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Love it, man. Oh, that's quite, it's, it's a good demonstration as well because, again, how training styles sort all of interlinked, like I mentioned earlier. Delt work, I do tend to do higher volumes, so that's actually quite a good example of something that I might do. Despite, like, I suppose our systems are similar, like the compound work heavy and then the isolation work more metabolic, volume, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, for me. <laughs> That'd be one set of four. That might be something I'd add. Not for Josh. I do, I will do three sets of stuff like that. Because I just like it. Like, it's yeah. just fun. Yeah. I just don't think that can overtrain you, personally. If you're going to have rest after it, like, it's, it's a little mini muscle. Used a lot, you know. It's, it feels good being. Look at the size of the guy. Six kilo dumbbells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Twelve and a half to nine to six. And our body weight is like. Well, here's the thing about strength. I can do probably the, the 17 and a half with pretty good form. He's easily wider than me. It's just, a, it's just like Matt said, you said today, Matt, a great point about strength. If you want to, I don't want to take it off yet. Well, it's not my point, so you okay. can have it anyway. Well, you're taking it off the guy who Matt took it yeah, off. Yeah, he's only told me it today, so this is quite bad. He just said that strength, it, it does, it's nothing. It's sort of thing. He's, I mean, he's got twice as long as arms as me. So how is my strength even relevant in the conversation about who's got, it's bodybuilding, it's about muscle. I think like strength is just an expression of a lot of different factors. Like he might have a stronger shoulder muscle, but the fact that his arms are four foot long, like, this point over here he can't so I can only use this weight like well that doesn't mean his shoulders are strong so again it's why when people sort of chase strength and things like that even like I don't want to make this about log booking because it's not that like but like how like how people like increase their lifts like week in week out like that's that doesn't mean that they necessarily got a bigger muscle Skill acquisition is a big thing, especially with beginning. Like we were talking about the beginner thing, but even even seasoned bodybuilders, skill acquisition is a massive thing. Like you just for six, seven weeks, you could just be getting better 
at a movement. And then well, if, you, if you translate, well, the numbers in this book have gone up, therefore I must now have a bigger muscle. Actually, you just may have got a lot more efficient of that movement. You learn how to do that skill better, like in terms of like signals and things firing in the body. Everything should like, How many people go into a gym? I, I said this to Tyler earlier, and they haven't done dumbbell press in ages, and they do, and you're all over the place. Like, and then all of a sudden, you go the next week, and everything's better. All you did was just get better at that movement. Your muscles, the actual chest muscle itself, never got bigger in that week, so I could do, oh, I've done an extra 10 kilos. But you see people banging 10, 15, 20 kilos on a bar every week. It's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily translate to more strength equals a bigger muscle. What I think we can all agree on is that progressive overload is king. The way I look at it is strength should increase, but over a longer time period. Like every year, or every six months, or every 12 months, if you're doing your training right, you should naturally be getting stronger as you grow. If you're not, something's wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to write it down or anything. You should be able to, you get a feel for in a gym whether, oh, I'm stronger now. Like, oh, my, my capacity to work is greater and all of that. Everything that rolls into progressive overload. For me, it's not necessarily this thing that occurs week to week to week to week. But as long as over time you're improving, Progressive overload still underpins all progress in bodybuilding, in my opinion. You have to be, and there's a many facets to it, like volume and rest periods, and there's a load of shit that, that you can actually use to track. Again, if you use strength as your guide, then, then cool. And over time that increases, and you're still measuring something. I just use different things to measure, like how you look in the mirror, like, things like that. Warm mat just kind of gets a feel, gets a feel for the movement. Obviously, I've gone through how I approach like my compound movements really, um, but things for slightly smaller body parts, um, and in my case, biceps, which is a weak body part comparatively, certainly. Just going heavy isn't going to get enough out of them because I'm going to find ways of kind of compensating elsewhere. So I'll do higher volume lead-in sets here. Um, so Matt's gonna do like a 20 rep set. So again, maximum blood, blood flow, get a nice pump off the bat. With a good pump, it's gonna get a better connection, mind-muscle connection. Second thing for me with bicep training is I don't benefit from doing much free weight. Because again, there's so many different factors that come into play, shoulder, joint, etc. So I'll find exercises that are pretty isolated. Obviously, we can't go much more isolated than the preacher curl. Matt's arms locked in place. The only movement's going to be through the elbow. So we're going to take him through these three leading sets, higher volume, to again, get blood in, get a more kind of metabolic response. And then we're going to do a top set. And again, because it's a weak body part, how can I make the movement harder and more efficient? I'm going to make Matt do a two second contraction each rep. So he's going to hold it every rep, probably go for a 10 to 12 top set. And then on the back off set, we'll go higher reps, maybe 12 to 15, and we'll go a drop set. So it's really throwing a lot more volume into a movement, but also a lot more, I suppose, factors that really focus on the contraction. Um, because it's a single joint movement, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, my arms are growing slowly, so I think there's something in it. So with regards with regard to tempo, now Matt, Matt's got fantastic arms, so he's you know the ideal candidate to make me look really good on this. But with tempo, aside from that top set where I'm going to make him hold the contraction just to get absolutely everything out of the bicep we can, I want him just to kind of, and anyone really, to go with feel. Um, you know, there's no, as long as the reps are consistent, so from his first leading set to the sort of final leading set, the tempo is consistent. I don't mind if that's super slow, I don't mind if it's like a little bit quicker, a lot, as long as there's an element of control over it. Perfect for Matt because you can see 
the sheer kind of exertion that he's putting into locking into that and to holding that squeeze. Again, like Tyler indicated earlier, on isolation movements, how can we make it more inefficient? By doing a two second hold, we've just made that weight twice as hard as that for Matt. He could have gone heavier, but he would have just been doing certainly not sloppy reps, but higher tempo reps. So yeah, awesome. And I'd say on this now, that if you do a, do a two second hold, I'll often then hold the weight now. Because the second set, we won't be doing that tempo. So the weight itself will be, or well, the, the movement itself, the set itself will be easier um, there. So we'll just do a single drop set. We're not going to go into the range. So a tempo that Matt's much more sort of comfortable with. But still, the weight's the same as our last set. Still going to be a demanding set. He's still going to take this to the death. And then we're throwing a drop in to, uh, again, get even more out of it. More volume, more blood flow. Yeah, on, big drive. Steps and then again, I might do two or three exercises kind of in a similar sort of format. Maybe not a drop to everyone, might do a rest pause, but just something generally per exercise is going to be an intensifier to get something out of that. You still pump, man. <laughs> I looked at it and I was like, You still pump just as much as you was before. <laughs> <laughs> 